Hey everybody, welcome in. It's Sunday, it's Q&A day. A lot of very interesting questions, but this is a serious time, so we'll take this very seriously. But what we'll cover today is obviously a lot to do with Bitcoin, a lot to do with the halving, a lot to do with ETFs, a lot to do with Hey, I'm new to Bitcoin. How do I build a bag fast? And what should I do? And where are we going to go from here? We'll look at a couple of new tokens. We'll look at, should I buy Nasana on this dip? We'll look at Apple stock. We'll look at MicroStrategy and how to do covered calls and a whole bunch more. And should we bank on a stock split? So thank you all for coming. And I think I got everything, but I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, <laughs> let's go. Um, and again, the tone will be a little bit serious in this one. But uh, let's just pile on in. And of course, anything I say is not financial advice. It's just, just a guy on the internet sharing numbers, which are becoming very popular, actually, in this market. Shout out to Fred Krueger as well. He just liked my Twitter post. I love your work, man. Okay, first of all, a little bit of context. This is what happened back in... And I actually had a channel back when this happened. I was in cash because I expected bad things to happen. And normally, when they do... The markets rebound very fast. In fact, the S&P 500 and Bitcoin rebounded hours, hours after the invasion. So the dip on the news and then the rebound. So I'm not going to get into anything else, uh, but let's just jump in. Questions come to come from Patreon. Thank you for everyone on Patreon. First question is, according to Glassnode, this is from Heavy Beef, and this is a super interesting question. Uh, Miles in Arizona, <laughs> by the dip. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Uh, according to Glassner, the Bitcoin multiplier is dynamic depending on market context. And I noticed the multiplier derived from on-chain data is far lower. It's a score of four times to ten times than your post-having multi of circa 70. Is there a reason why you calculate much higher multiples? And could it be wrong? Yes. <laughs> so, great question. And I actually went to the section, read the newsletter from Glassnode on this exact issue, and I subscribed to Glassnode, and they did great work. But let me explain where we are a little bit different. So first of all, the chart you were looking at was looking was based on what they call realized cap. And the realized cap is a metric that represents the value of all Bitcoins at the price when they were last transacted on chain divided by the number of Bitcoins in circulation. So there's two things that are up with that. And, you know, flaws. It's a good metric, but it doesn't work for the multiplier. In my mind, and I could be wrong, but let me explain. <laughs> and by the way, I was the first one to come up with the Bitcoin multiplier in 2021 when Tesla bought $1.5 billion of Bitcoin in a very short window of time. And I was calculating the impact on price and the scarcity and everything else. And things are a lot harder now than back then as well. Joseph, thank you for coming. So let's break down this realized cap. First of all, two points. The value of all Bitcoins at the price they were last transacted on chain. And number two, the Bitcoins in circulation. I argue 5 million Bitcoin are lost. 1 million of those are the Satoshi stash. And of those, many were transacted at peanuts peanut levels. So what I mean by that is the value of all Bitcoin at the price they were last transacted. We know a huge percentage of Bitcoin has not been transacted since it was like $10. So it's not really relevant. And Bitcoins in circulation, I would argue there are a lot less than people believe. Therefore, I believe the RC is skewed. Now, a quick reminder of long-term holders. This is from our top and bottom indicator in green. We are now greater than 70% long-term holders in Bitcoin. The price line behind is the price of Bitcoin, but we're hitting all record highs. And again, Bitcoin is lost every year. That goes into the long-term holder stash. That will only go up. Of course, if we get to crazy times, people will sell. But remember, we're looking at a float of maybe 14 million Bitcoin, max 15 that will ever exist by all my math, which I've been calculating and tracking lost wallets, lost Bitcoin, since about 2017, part of my obsession with the hardness of Bitcoin. Now, let's look at some numbers and break more stuff down regarding the multiplier. First of all, if we look, and again, super simple math here. 64 days, ETFs pulled in, 200,000 Bitcoin approximately. Average price, 55K. Money flow into the new 
bitcoins uh, into the new asset, 11 billion. Divide that by 19.6, not the actual 15, just 19.6, you get 561. And the average actual price increase was $30,000. And that gives you a multiplier of 53.45 because the price, say 70, it came off the highs. It was 70 when I did this a couple of days ago. Now, we can forget all the rest, but I have other illustrations to show you what I'm talking about. One, simple back of the napkin math ETF only multiplier. So money spent by the nine new American ETFs for Bitcoin, $29 billion. Dumpage by Grayscale, $16.3 billion. That's a net inflow of 12.7 billion. Bitcoin market cap, January 11th, 839 billion. Bitcoin market cap today, today, by the way, and it was much higher a few days ago, uh, 1.269 trillion. Changing market cap, 429.7 billion. And the investment, 12.7 billion. That gives you an ETF multiplier alone of 33.8 million. Now, sorry, 33.8. Not 21, not 56, 33.8, but we're only talking about the nine ETFs. Now, let's look at the back of the napkin pre-Iran situation, pre-dump. It was 48.2. Let's look at a third illustration. This is including Michael Saylor on MicroStrategy and Mr. 100. Okay, Mr. 100 bought, since the beginning of the ETFs, 19,712 Bitcoin. Uh, MicroStrategy bought 25,000 Bitcoin. And you add them all up, you get a multiplier of all those together of 40.5. Again, we're just talking only the ETFs and these two players. There's lots of other buyers too that we probably don't know about or are aware of. And that's where we are. So I'm still very confident that the multiplier in reality is north of 50. After the halving, we'll see. 70 up to 112 is my guess of what that'll be. But it all depends on exactly what's happening in the market and how much money is flowing in. Because if you get that perpetual bid and people aren't selling, things could go pretty crazy. But remember, there is always a price that these long-term holders could let their Bitcoin go. But many that I've spoken to are waiting for a million dollars. So it's going to be hard to pry Bitcoin from those hands that are out there. Now, related to that is this from Saab 14 and Black Float. Assuming 21 million Bitcoin with 6 million lost, I say 5, and 2 million yet to be mined, I say 1.4, leaving 13 million in circulation. The latest halving reduces new Bitcoin creation from 328,500 to 164,250. That 164, you can calculate yourselves. Take 450, multiply it by 365. You get that number in case anybody's asking. This decrease is only 1.26 of the available 13 million Bitcoin. How does such a small reduction in new Bitcoin creation relative to supply lead to anticipation of such price increases? Brilliant. So there's many, many aspects to this. Most of it is fundamental economics, but there is some other aspects too as well. So let's talk about a couple of them. Uh, first of all, we have the supply shock. And that is, <laughs> when we go from 900 issued a day to 450, that is a big supply shock. Each having every four years reduces the rate at which new Bitcoins are created and hence lowers the inflation rate of the cryptocurrency. Now, the actual number is small compared to the total circulating market cap. But remember, a lot of the total circulating market cap is lost. And as you said, it's in long-term holders' hands. So it's not really liquid. It's not really available for sale. And I've stated many times over the last 18 months, we are going into the first ever post-having situation where there is diminishing supply that's available, that's liquid. Also, stock-to-flow model. Again, widely cited in other precious assets, commodities, real estate, you name it, it also applies to Bitcoin, despite what people will say. <laughs> and the Bitcoin stock to flow ratio, again, has a huge impact on it. Then you've got market sentiment and speculation. Havings do tend to attract significant media attention. We haven't even seen that yet. That's going to come next week and the week after. And this can lead to some speculative demand as traders and investors buy. Now, it's no coincidence as well. I've been talking a lot about Hong Kong and China that they are rushing to get their spot ETFs out before the halving. 
they don't want to wait till after just in case the price goes up too high. So that's logical. And that's part of what we're talking about here in that market sentiment and speculation. Then we have historical precedent, tons of it that we can analyze of how Bitcoin goes up after the halving and then the psychological factors. This is kind of an interesting one. I think about a lot like FOMO, etc. Also panic selling. Yesterday we saw a lot of panic selling. <laughs> and then and then we're going to get panic buying in five days. It's it's human nature. And again, as I always stress as well, if you are in the investing game, you leave your emotions at the door. You can be emotional in other areas of life, but not with investing. Remember that. Okay, let's go back to uh, the psychological factors. Again, as Bitcoin get, and I don't know if this is true or not, but it's in my head. As Bitcoin gets scarcer, as it approaches maximum supply, we're 19.6 million now out of 21. The next 1.4 million or less will be minted over the next 120 years. And that reinforces the perception of Bitcoin as a scarce asset, way harder than, than gold. This is the true digital scarcity that's out there. And this perception can encourage long-term holders to hold because there's reduced supply. That's why many of these long-term holders are waiting for a million bucks because they know it's a matter of time. Time. Can they wait four years, six years, eight years? Hell yeah. Yes, they can. Also, the other aspect is network security and minor economics. The having has a huge impact on miners, and this can affect the number of miners operating, potentially increasing the cost of miners as well. If the price doesn't increase to offset the reduced reward, and then long-term holders are increasing. Again, as I covered earlier in the previous question, many are just lost and they are get added to that whole stack. Now, that was a long-winded answer, but these are all the elements that go into this halving pie that drive the price up, okay? I don't know what percentage of each impacts the price, but what I do know is this. Let's look at a simple illustration. Excluding Asia, Europe, Brazilian ETFs, etc., Canadians, Swedish, Germans, Swiss. Let's just look at the last 64 trading days, okay? The amount of Bitcoin sucked in, on the top left, uh, corner is in blue and in the middle, all right? The nine new ETFs bought 530,000 Bitcoin. Uh, Mr. 100 bought 21,100. And MicroStrategy bought 25,096. Remember, <laughs> this is a crazy thing. In five days, we're only going to get 164,000 a year, okay? If, now I assume, if we take the number of trading days and... Uh, you take 64 days, take the number of trading days in the year, 252 divided by 64. You get the multiplier and you can multiply, again, the demand from the ETFs. If it continues, of course, they won't be able to buy that much because there simply isn't 2.1 million Bitcoin available. But the point is the price will go up because they will be buying some. They won't be able to buy that much. If they do try and buy that much, the price is going to go to the moon. That's just simple mathematics. And it's just a crazy visual to actually look at to see where we're going to go. So way more money. It's a real asset class chasing way, way, way fewer Bitcoin. Okay. And we'll talk about another guy just bought a ton today. Basically, it's going to equate to what the daily issuance is in five days, which will blow your minds. We'll get to that in a minute. Now. If I pool all my assets, this is from Mangok and Jobberwalker. If I pool all my crypto assets, I'm a whole coiner. I want to use my Bitcoin so I can retire in five years. I'm 53 now, but I can't part with my precious whole coin. What can I do in the next five years to make one Bitcoin work for me without actually using it? So there's a number of things you can do. But first of all, I personally... Do not trust a lot of the vehicles we'll talk about, but I'm hoping in the next year or two, there will be trusted entities where it'll make this completely foolproof and safe as we do it. And remember, never, ever lend out all your Bitcoin, only a tiny, tiny little piece, like 10% or less, if ever. It's always been the rule since 2021. Now, these are some options you can consider, but remember, all carry risk. So you can do Bitcoin backed loans, borrow against your Bitcoin, buy something like a rental apartment and generate perpetual cash. That used to work in the old days. I don't know how easy it is to make it work these days, 
But again, it'll allow you to access liquidity without selling your holdings. Um, again, be careful. I wouldn't do it yet till I get really, really safe players to be able to do that. Um, but anyway, there's also things like yield generating platforms too that are out there, but they are also historically very dangerous. Then you can do staking via wrapped Bitcoin. I don't like wrapping anything. I'm just sharing ideas out there. Um, but these are kind of like in DeFi protocols. Then in addition, what I prefer to do is invest in Bitcoin proxies or build your bag by using tools like PTOS or ARB Cloud and swapping between different assets to make money that way. That way you can grow your bag. You can build, you can go beyond your one Bitcoin and then you can start taking more risk with your assets. Uh, and the same uh, most successful way is just long-term holding. Get into an asset early, sit and wait. Don't try to get too fancy. Don't try to get too cute. This thing is going up. It's a game of patience. And remember, I think it was Warren Buffett that said, markets are mechanisms to move money from the impatient to the patient. Words to that effect. I could be completely wrong. But anyway, I think it was him. Uh, but that's such an important lesson. You're in a pristine asset. Be patient. You have five years. It'll take us to 2029, 20, 2030. 20, then things will be radically different. The infrastructure will be far more secure and safe. And you'll be able to, you know, live off a of piece. Maybe generate some type of yield or borrow against it to buy a holiday home that you live in part-time and rent out the rest of the time. That would be uh, a simple way forward. Next question. What is your advice to retail over what they will face the next five days and post having of who want to build a bag of Bitcoin? Kichi, this is a question. There's a lot of people that are kind of new and unfortunately they weren't able to stack sub 20K, but still let's look at some data here as to what's going to happen potentially over the next five days. There's lots of stuff flying around. The Twitterverse of, oh, Bitcoin's going to go back to 20K, 35K, 40K. Bitcoin's going to fall 40%. I've, I've read it all. Okay, we're down from this crash yesterday from the top. I think it was like 17 or 18%. We were here before, a week or so ago. So it shouldn't be any surprise. But let's look at one of the things that we have built is the layer model. And basically... This shows you where it could go and where we could meet levels of support. And this calculates it based on history and other elements to determine where we could fall to if we fall at all. So 61,600 could be the support line at level six. The next support line is 54,500. It's unlikely we hit this level unless, of course, all hell breaks out with nukes flying overheads and stuff like that. That's possible but it's more likely we head up from here. And I'll show you why in a second. Uh, the other uh, option is DCAS. Again, this helps you stack. You buy at opportune times. You do not buy on squeezes. When it's red, you buy when it's in the green zone and it modifies the actual buy size. And right now DCS has been firing up like crazy buying this dip. I would c configure this to daily and bull mode aggressive for accumulating Bitcoin because we know where it's going and it's going higher. How my, how high? We're not sure. 150, 170. Some people are talking 250. I think 130 to 150 easy. So it's a 2x. But if you're buying again a 15 or 16, it's a 10x, which is kind of crazy. But that's why I always stress get in early, get in hard, but still not too late to DCAS. Now, the other thing is Mr. 100 bought four times today. And Mr. 100 is using DCS to build their, D their Bitcoin bag. And they've gotten much better at buying dips. They go in harder when it dips. So very proud of their work. And they bought 100. Then they bought another 100. Then they waited a few hours and bought another 100. And then they just bought another 100 literally half an hour ago. And uh, so they've bought 400 Bitcoin in just one day. Impeccable timing. Five days before the halving. Smart moves. They know what's going to happen next they know and they are stealthily stacking a bag with great regularity but let's talk about this and i shared this yesterday the important thing to note here after the having a lot of people say oh we're going to crash and everything else if we go back to the previous cycle 
okay, May 2020, the price was at 8,572. We're now, let me check the Bitcoin price live. 65.4. Let me check actually. Yeah, pretty sure. 65.1. Okay. And after the halving, the lowest we dipped for the next four years was down to 8,535. It only dipped 0.41% after the halving. So the question is, can you risk waiting for that dip after the halving? Could a dip happen? Yes. Historically speaking, no, it doesn't. And 0.41% is nothing as good as a 20% off right now, give or take a couple of percentage points. So that's what I would say is, you know, we're still early. If you have a long-term time frame, like three to five years or more, but get in as early as you can. Not financial advice, of course. Next question is from Alpha Leaps. Uh, there are community members that weren't able to get in early on MicroStrategy in order to accumulate 100 shares for selling covered calls. Should they continue to add to their MicroStrategy bag in case there is a stock split in the future that would get them to 100 shares, e.g. 50 shares, 2 for 1 goes to, you know, 50 shares will get you to 100. If it's a 4 for 1, 25 shares will get you to 100. The question is, what would you do? So, interesting one. There are certain stocks that never do stock splits. But certain stocks have to because stock splits help them do things like allocate employee shares. So, we don't know if there's going to be like a Berkshire Hathaway. But do not bank on a stock split. Um, again, could happen. Would it? I'm not sure. I, I, I really don't know. But I wouldn't count on it. We'll see what happens. Also, uh, I would still consider an accumulation strategy but the beauty the beauty of micro strategy and that's when i've been obsessed with it since august 2020 is the arb and we built a model for that called arb cloud and you can flip between pure bitcoin or now ibit etc in a retirement account and micro strategy you play the arb all day long we've got people that triple their bag in three months playing with this tool so turning one bitcoin into three bitcoin by just playing the ARB. That's probably a safer bet right now than covered calls because on a Bitcoin spike or MicroStrategy short squeeze, you can get called out and lose all your shares too. And who's saying when you can get back on the train? This is a very special money glitch stock that we'll see once in a generation. So enjoy the ride. But I like the way you're thinking, but start thinking about playing other avenues as well to grow your bag would be what I would think of. Next question is from Mama. How much effect will ETH ETF approval have on the altcoin market in general? Isn't there a risk that the whole altcoin market will go down substantially with ETH if the SEC doesn't approve the ETH ETF? So there's a couple of considerations there. So what I try to do is think about all the pros and cons of what happens if the ETH ETF is approved and the cons of what happens if it is not so first of all, these are some of the top five things I think could happen. One, if it is approved, it'll give investors confidence in the cryptocurrency market beyond Bitcoin, which will lead to more capital inflow, which will raise all boats, which I'll say a lot probably in the next couple of slides. And this could actually drive a huge surge in Ethereum's price if there's a lot of ETF demand. Now, it will also improve the sentiment towards altcoins. And for a second here, the SEC doesn't have a leg to stand on because in the court of law, it was proven that XRP is not a security. And as I've always said, if XRP is not a security, I don't know what is. That means ETH should be a shoe in which means all the other L1s should be as well. And at the end of the day, it's Larry Fink who picks up the phone and tells the folks what to do. So that would actually help all the altcoins as well. It would also bring regulatory clarity to the US, which could encourage other countries to develop clear regulations for crypto, which would also benefit the altcoin market. And the approval of a major ETF could pave the way for more. And again, float all boats as well. So that is the pros if it happens. It's probably going to happen, but we don't know when. Could it be 
three months from now or a year from now, somewhere in that time frame, I think is a good chance of it happening. Now, the cons of what could happen if it's not approved, if they reject it, it could negatively impact Ethereum's price. But remember, ETH has survived without an ETF. It doesn't really need it. So the price hit may not be that much at all. And we've seen that a little bit. However, if there is a sell-off uh, following the ETH denial, <laughs> that, that could be bad and that could affect other alts. It could also drive increased regulatory scrutiny on other altcoins. And the other kind of con, this is weird because it's not a con of them denying the ETH ETF, but a con of if it is approved, it could lead to a crowding out of effect where all the capital flows into Ethereum and that would be at the expense of the other altcoins. Again, I don't see that happening much, but I do not expect an ETH ETF to run like Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a special asset, special category, etc. And there is an unlimited source of people now throwing rocks and mud at Ethereum about why it has problems. Um, and I can speak to the technical issues it has, but uh, the smart money will know there are probably safer, better, more undervalued places to go as well. So um, that's kind of what I think. Uh, it will be approved. It'll help the whole space. It'll float all boats, but it could take some time. Next question as well from two people. Patreon member since December. The only thing I regret is not discovering it earlier. <laughs> well, never too late. Can you give the compendium scores for the AI play Autonolas, Olas is the ticker, O-L-A-S, and Athena, E-N-A. Both are promoted by some known financiers on X. I would like to know your take. So red flag number one. When things are pushed hard, when things are sold hard, that in itself is a red flag. I don't know who they are, but all I look at is kind of fundamental stuff. Let's let's break them down. And again, I don't want to offend anybody. These are just things I look at when I analyze any any token. And my job is to find the top 1% of assets. I'm not interested in the other 99%. Not at all. That's why we've spent countless numbers of years building models to sniff them out. Now, let's look at the first one first. Olas. A couple of things here. Um, it's number 2611. So we only analyze the top 500, 600 cryptos in great detail. Uh, for the smaller ones, like this size, there's not a lot of information out there. Um, we have done some special work for some select names as well that are part of the solo portfolio, but not this one as well. So I don't like the fact it's so small. I also see some open questions. Uh, Self-reported circulating supply. 47.61 million tokens. Total supply, 536. Max supply, no idea. And FDMC, 2 billion. So for what it is, it's already expensive. Is there upside? No. I can tell right now the tokenomics wouldn't be good. It wouldn't score well and the compendium score as well. Now, that lead, led me to say, oh, what exactly do the tokenomics look like? So I went to the website. Normally they have it published on the website. Nothing. Read the white paper, got this. And it didn't mean anything to me. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't like it already. Now, final piece, it's an ETH contract. As you know, if you follow this channel, I believe there's too many ETH contracts and I don't know if they're going to make it. It's a murderer's row of competitors trying to compete using technology that's old. In my small brain... It's not the way to go. Now, uh, let's look at the other one. Athena is, we have it categorized as a payment platform, and we know a lot of chains kind of pivot to um, AI. Uh, we see Bitcoin miners try to pivot to AI. That type of pivot is dangerous, so we don't like it. Anyway, the point is, on the crypto compendium, this one does exist, and it lands dead last in this category. And even if it is a true AI play, even if it's dead last year, that's an extremely bad sign because some of these puppies it's up against are really bad. So, yeah. Sorry, as usual, I nixed both. Remember, be in the top 1% of assets. Remember, anything that's pumped hard is probably a scam. And you know how I know that? Because I see what happens behind the curtain. And it's ugly. And I've never done a paid promotion. Never will. All right? Uh, 
just just do your own research take the data learn find the top one percent of assets do not listen to if somebody's pumping something hard they have an agenda and it's not to help you. Remember that. All right, Nasana. Next question is from three people. Doc Intern, How's Noise, and Ross H. Nasana has been plumbing recently, down 50% over the last few weeks. Anything changed with the project? Better competitors? And do we need to sell and get into other salts? So first perspective is kind of an easy one. AI as a category has gotten hammered. And so have all altcoins. So if you look at Pith and all the others, they're all down 50% from the all-time high. Remember, we had this crazy, crazy... We were able to buy things in December for pennies. And they went to like 8 or 7 or $10. It was madness. Everything kind of mean reverts. In addition, I do believe the meme coins have sucked a lot of the liquidity and oxygen from the room. Because everybody's going into meme coins. And that's, again, something I don't do. Uh, AI is tired, but it will return. There's two things that are important right now in the world, AI and crypto. That's it. That's the only two categories I'm invested in. Uh, I am holding, and I've been considering buying more, but I need this to give me the flash signal. And it hasn't given me that yet. And this is the ATR model on the daily for Nasana. And it's right. 95.65% of the time tells you when to buy, when to sell. Settings are there. Uh, custom ATR anchor based on trend and zero noise suppression. Let it let it do its thing. Don't even tweak it. And uh, you can see here, there is no yellow. The last red got us out before and we're just sitting and waiting for that thing, little green triangle to pop in a buy. And uh, hopefully that'll come soon because sub $3 for Nasana is a good deal considering it was at seven or eight bucks uh, a few weeks ago. But remember, it was pennies in december okay so nothing goes straight up remember that next question is from invest questions one. Oh my god uh, i love the name what is your updated opinion on apple i hold that stock and wanted to sell some shares to buy tesla but don't know if it is the right moment since today it started to go up again and tesla might not go up in a few weeks or months nfa so this is a a interesting question tough question I'm just going to talk about Apple, why I got out of it. I can't remember a year and a half ago. I was a long-term Apple holder, and I just said, Ugh. I like growth. I like visionaries. And it was kind of losing its way. And that was cemented just a couple of weeks ago when they gave up their Apple car, which was supposed to be the Tesla killer, and it didn't. So the reason for over a year and a half or a year, I can't remember when I got rid of it, uh, revenue growth slowing. Uh, has been decelerating for a long time. The lack of vision for the future growth is a big issue. The company has faced criticism for not providing clear, compelling vision for its future growth. And these goggles aren't going to cut it, in my opinion. I know people that have them love them, but at three and a half thousand dollars, whatever they cost, they're simply too expensive for the mass market. Also, there's lots of regulatory pressure now in the App Store. That is a huge money maker for them, taking thirty percent of what developers should get. Uh, that's going to hurt if that goes away. Um, no Apple Car that failed. That shows you they are not the company they used to be. Under Steve Jobs, this company did not fail. They executed flawlessly, and uh, Apple Vision is not going to make it. And iPhone sales are being eaten by Android around the world. It's all pretty clear. The stock is fairly valued, and I know it does bounce between whatever, 150, 170, 180. It's pretty much at fair value right now, so there's not much upside. And uh, they do have a potential ace in the hole. That is the new M4 chip, which is focused on AI and inference. But so is everybody else building one of those chips. And I just think, you know, do you want to be with one of the greatest inventors of our time, Steve Jobs, who is sadly no longer with us, or Elon Musk. Uh, my money would not be on Apple, uh, put it that way. Um, so hope that helps. Next is from Elite APS. You've mentioned ZS Network before. I bought a bag of it on the launch pad when it opened. Uh, could you go into further detail on why you're bullish on ZS and its price potential this cycle? So I thought it'd be interesting if it would be a stacks killer system. There are two things I was interested in. Uh, the backers are solid. Tokenomics are okay. Market timing. I always wait 30 days or so after 
such a launch because of the sell pressure. And that's proven to be right here. But the, the other key thing um, that I don't like is when I went in, so I'm very big on dog fooding stuff, testing it out, making sure it works. Only 40% of the capability worked that I was expecting. So I didn't buy. Um, I was interested in the project after it launched, after I tested it. Didn't seem uh, that interesting to me. Also, it's pretty fairly valued too. There's not the upside that I want to take on that type of risk. So I did not buy. I think I have some airdropped in a couple of wallets somewhere, but I didn't even bother to look because <laughs> I didn't have time. Um, so I could hold some. I probably do hold some. I have no idea how much or where it is, but that's it. It's n not until they start becoming that stacks killer will I get interested. When that happens, yes, potentially. And uh, next question, Craig M. With the consensus now being that rate cuts are coming starting in June or July, is there data to understand whether or not rate cuts are generally bullish or bearish? So typically rate cuts happen when things go bad. But by the time we know things go bad, we already know the gone bad. So the, the way the government data reacts, it's always a year late and a dollar short. So they're always late to the party. You know, we had recessions a year and a half ago. <clears throat> we have 20 states in the US that are probably in a recession. And all the GDP growth is coming from government spending. That's the reality. They'll tell you the labor market's great. No, no full-time jobs have been created. They're all part-time jobs. They'll say GDP is growing 4%. No, only because of the money printing is growing governmental GDP, not your business on the street. So that's that's the tricky thing. So going back to my point of view is, first of all, a whole bunch of nonsense out there. I've always had this same position. Fed does not control inflation. They destroy demand. Real simple. Uh, the inflation is a monetary phenomenon. And oil drives 40% of the CPI. And 2% is a unicorn dream. That's it. That's my point of view regarding all of this nonsense that's happening out there. Soft landings. It's a, pff, forget about it. Now, what I am concerned about, though, is this. And again, I don't want to offend anybody, but I just call out what I see. I look at the U.S. government as if it was my personal finances. They are on course to be paying $2 trillion in interest. Okay, $2 trillion. That's three times the military industrial complex pocket lining budget. Three times. In a time when the world is a little bit shaky. That's a waste of money. All right. Also, USA is picking fights all over the planet. I don't agree with that. Let people solve their own problems. Also, <laughs> I told you this to be political. Um, <laughs> the not cutting the interest rates is actually crushing so many sectors of the economy. You know, anybody that manufactures anything of value, like car companies, they're getting crushed right now because the cost, not only of insurance, is going to the moon, but the cost of financing is to the moon. There was a brutal time. Real estate market, okay, we've seen prices slashed all across the board. And a ton, we saw a huge spike last week of inventory for sale all over the country in the U.S. People want out. And there's no buyers because unless you're a cash buyer, you can't afford the payment. I read a report this morning. I posted it, I think, on Patreon. Only 16% of the population can afford the average house in this country today. 16%. The American dream is no longer available for 84% of the country, which is very sad. And the increasing debt burden by paying nearly $2 trillion in interest payments will increase for generations. It'll be the next generation and the generation after that's burden. Debt spiral from hell right now is what we're going through. So it's just, it's it's nonsense. <laughs> uh, they print all the money in the world and funnel it to banks and spend a ton of money on interest. It's just nonsense, complete nonsense in my opinion. But I look at it just from a financial perspective. I don't know how, how politics works. And favorite part of the week, everybody, helping animals. Uh, this week, we sponsored Black Pine Sanctuary, and they provide a refuge to captive-raised exotic animals while educating and advocating and building awareness about animal welfare. And this week, we adopted Fiero, Todd, and Marley. They're all red foxes, and aren't they very cute? And tomorrow, DCA Live, 7.30 a.m. Pacific, 4.30 Stockholm time on my channel. 
with Ivan and CTO and people were saying, can we do that today? We really need answers. So we'll do it tomorrow morning. <laughs> they, these guys are in their weekend right now. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe. A lot of work uh, goes into these things and we appreciate you all for coming. Now, some live questions from the audience and let me check on the markets and make sure nothing is kind of scary out there. Uh, yay, Solana's up 3%. That's not bad. And Bitcoin is moving up. Yeah. It looks like that 64, 65 level should be put in the rearview mirror soon. If history repeats, which it normally does 90% of the time. That's why. Study your history, ladies and gentlemen. It's so important. And that helps you weather these types of storms so you don't freak out as well when, when little gray swans happen. Gabriel, in the Czech Republic, <laughs> waiting to wash the dishes of the day and KPM simultaneously. Well done. Good, good person for helping around the house. Uh, Doc Intern, which three of the Sol alts are you most bullish on long-term and which ones are better buy at the current levels? Um, the three I like, actually. Um, Chad is a really interesting project. Nosana and Fluxbeam. They're kind of the three that I believe have the most upside. But again, they're all very risky. Um, but I look at a combination of factors like market size, unique position, moat, tokenomics, uh, chart and uh, they're the three that I like right now but I still I have at this stage I don't know 10 or 11 or 12 and my strategy is get a little position hold till the end of the bull run and then move into something else that's my plan has not changed anything I bought I still have uh, Trask Bergeson got a run we'll watch later huge thanks to the family thank you Trask miles in Arizona by the dip dog one Keep holding Bitform, Bitform and Riot, and do we only trust CleanSpark? So I am like my CleanSpark. If you imagine $100 in my miners, which is a fraction of how much I have in MicroStrategy, I am 90% CleanSpark. A uh, tiny bit of Bitfarms, a little bit more of Riot. Uh, I think Riot are looking to really scale their hash as our CleanSpark, as our Bitfarms. There was some good news about Bitfarms that came out as well. Uh, last week, they are at 7x a hash now, if I recall correctly. They're interesting names, um, but again, you want to be in the leanest, meanest, with the most modern rig miners, especially <laughs> six days from now. It'll be very important. So I'm I'm holding I'm holding them all, but pretty much for all intents and purposes, I'm all in on CleanSpark, and my investment strategy is to pick winners and go hard, go for the jugular, heavy conviction. I don't dabble around with many assets. In fact, I feel very uncomfortable now because I own too many, but 90% of my portfolio is in four things, four only. So bear that in mind. And one of those four is not CleanSpark. Friendly man, <laughs> and I, we trust. Thank you for being here, buddy. And Max Grease, uh, BlackRock Bitcoin flight to safety, not yet. When? That's an interesting one because if you look at what gold has done, Gold is kind of like MicroStrategy. You can sniff out some stuff. Again, this gray swan did cause the people that were in touch with the geopolitical situation to do a little bit of a flight to safety. Central Bank in China is stacking gold like crazy. It's helping the price. Silver has been to the moon. Bitcoin is still considered a risk asset. It will not be considered a flight to safety yet. But however, when I go back to the banking crisis in March 2023, I did notice when that happened... Bitcoin went up. So in certain types of financial catastrophes, it is a flight to safety. Geopolitical, not so much right now. Soon, yes. And Joseph, thank you so much for being here and all your updates. B-Man, gracias, danke, and thank you for everything you do. Oh, no, please, no more thank you. As living, small living mobile, great video. Thanks as ever, thank you. And Recluse Man, up there in Canada for the butterflies. Love it. We've got to look at some more butterflies, too. Um, waiting to wash the dishes still in Czech Republic. Doc Intern, which three of the Sol AIs are you most bullish on long-term? So again, I tend to be heavily concentrated. I have a, li I have a little bit of render, but my, my Nosana position is heavier. And my render position I've had long-term um, from my Should I Buy video. Uh, but my Nosana position is much bigger. So that's it. Just those two. Um, again, and I feel comfortable, uncomfortable having some money. I nearly got rid of my render <laughs> because I felt Nasana was better uh, value uh, lower down. But anyway, 
that's where I am. Let me see. And again, there's so many. I hate having a lot of stuff because it's like you have a barn full of little kittens you got to run after and make sure they're all doing good. And it's just a headache. So I've got to start culling, <laughs> culling the assets uh, in the next couple of weeks and months. Keep it simple. Keep it small. Uh, let me see. Do, do, do. What did I miss? I hope I get everything. Let me know if I missed anything. Um, how come I don't see that? Sorry for you, but it's good. Pancake Panda as well. And thank you as well for your super sticker, Andy Glenjo, Signal 103. Bitcoin is 65,200 bucks. Still hasn't moved. That's the Binance. By the way, there's a discrepancy between Binance and other chains. Everything is holding up okay. Uh, a lot of people think the worst of the storm may be over. If history repeats, it will be. Okay, I'm going to show that one chart one more time as well to give people some comfort as to what's going on out there in the marketplace. And bring it up. Hold on a second. This puppy. Is that coming up? Yeah, this is probably the most important thing just to give you guys all and gals some comfort out there. Literally within 8 or 10 hours after Russia invaded Ukraine, stock market dipped and then rebounded and went to new highs hours later. Okay. The uh, tomorrow morning will be a time when we have our sniper rifles ready. <laughs> okay. Fingers crossed for a couple of opportunities. But uh, anyway, so we'll pray for peace in the Middle East. Hopefully people know. Why don't they just put the leaders of these two places in the cage and have them fight it out amongst themselves, not affect everybody else. And at least from the reports I heard, the missiles were all shot down and everybody is fine and safe in Israel. So that's at least something nobody has hurt. Let's just hope... There's no retaliation. Uh, rather, come to a table, negotiate like intelligent human beings. Don't just use religion as excuse. I'm getting, I'm getting off the rails here. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. Take care out there. Love each other. Be safe. Bye.